short introduction for myself, then I leave it to Andy. My name is Salil. I'm a Microsoft Data Platform MVP from Turkey originally, but living in uh, London. I'm running the Power BI Turkey user group. We are all ears, Andy. We are listening to you. Thank you very much, Halil. Thank you. Yes, well, it is rainy <laughs> where I am. It <laughs> appears that it's rainy in a lot of different places as well. However, we can be rest assured that all of Microsoft's servers in Azure are in data centers that are sheltered from the rain. So I think we'll be OK. We'll be good to go. Um, thank you, Halil. Thank you. And, and, and again, thanks for reaching out and um, my pleasure and, you know, uh, and uh, and um, you know, asking me if I'd like to present the session. I've presented one last year, which was pre fabric announcement, which was around May 2023. So around May 2023, we had the public preview and public announcement of fabric. Before then, I'd spoken about Synapse Analytics and Power BI and how they can work together. And now we're in a world where, well, hey, do we actually have to provision another service for data warehousing and lake house architectures and storing data and transforming data and then have another service like Power BI consuming it? Or is, do we now have a service in which everything can be done in one platform and fernando yes is as your synapse analytics dead i think i'd like to keep it quite interactive to be honest with you <laughs> yeah, yeah i yeah. think it's yeah it's um it's it's one of those things that is the, the elephant in the room right it's the elephant in the room is synapse analytics dead from a microsoft perspective they say no whether we fully 100 percent trust that that's the case is a different matter. There was a great blog by um, Paul Andrew around Synapse. And the one quote that really resonated was Synapse Analytics has had a hard life. So it, yes, I don't think we're under any illusions that, you know, that Synapse Analytics, when it was announced, you know, back in and this is now nearly four, uh, five years ago. So the, the back end of nine of uh, 2019, where Microsoft announced Synapse Analytics. And, and we'll go through that in this session. So I know that Microsoft have retired the DP500, which I'll be honest, was a little bit of a disappointment for me. Um, being an advocate of certification, obviously certification, achieved in the correct way by learning your experience. But it was disappointing that the DP500, which was the enterprise, the Azure Enterprise Analyst certification was retired, which within its criteria and skills being measured was Synapse, dedicated SQL pools, serverless SQL pools. So, yeah. I, I can't I can't answer that. I will continue to advocate Synapse for a specific use case and a specific scenario that uh, that we'll go through. Other people, of course, will have all sorts of opinions about the service itself. So I know that I've titled this the showdown, but actually, when we look at going through the demo, it's more collaborative. And I want to explain as I go through the go through the um, go through the demo why that is, because, yes, these two services can talk to each other. Now, it might be from a migration perspective or it might be from an existing infrastructure perspective that you can get these two services working together. But I want to cover the two services. We'll go through. Well, how I see each service in Fabric and each service in Synapse and how they map together, you know, the like for like, you know, is something in Synapse the same within Fabric? If we want to migrate from Synapse to Fabric, 
what do we do? What service are we going from and what service are we going to? So I want to cover those things. So just a little bit about me. So I work independently with the Microsoft data stack, predominantly Azure. Uh, if you scan the QR code, that takes you to my Twitter. So I love having a conversation about all these things. Honestly, really, I have a great I have a great time, you know, discussing, you know, data architecture, you know, Azure data services, obviously Synapse and Fabric. Um, my company website is datahigh.co.uk. However, I blog mostly at serverlesssql.com. That's where I put all my Synapse and Fabric, uh, Fabric blogging. And I'm part of the Data Toboggan um, team. So at the moment, we are uploading all of the sessions to our YouTube channel from the conference that we had a couple of weeks ago. So there's lots and lots of Fabric, Warehouse, Lakehouse, Power BI uh, videos that we're uploading over time. But the website, datatoboggan.co.uk, will be a jumping off point for all the future events and the, the YouTube channel that we've got there. So in the agenda, yes, we're going to cover what is Synapse Analytics. Um, anyone who ever went to a Synapse Analytics session from four years ago, three years ago, five years ago, this isn't going to be anything new. But we want to recap because it kind of sets the scene for Fabric and the question of why. Why have Microsoft released another platform, a new tool? Why? What's the reasoning? Yes, a service mapping. So I'm looking at the services within Synapse. I'm looking at the services within Fabric and I'm saying, OK, well, what services match each other from a service that's available in Synapse and a service that's available in Fabric, what should I be using? How should I be thinking about mapping those services together? And common patterns, which don't just include Lakehouse, but Warehouse as well. And yeah, again, so are we going to be outdated if we offer a yeah. Synapse solution to new customers? Look, I have probably stopped advocating dedicated SQL pools, right? The, 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 the one thing with dedicated SQL pools, they were always a specialized service for multi terabyte, large scale relational data warehousing. And when it was included within Synapse and rebadged as dedicated SQL pools, I kind of felt that it was trying to be put forward as a general generalized uh, data warehouse service which did confuse a lot of people its architecture is fundamentally different from a sql server or an azure sql database different sensibilities different patterns that you have to bring to it i'll be honest i probably wouldn't advocate dedicated going forward but with serverless which the sql engine in fabric in both the lake house and the warehouse is built from yes i still advocate using synapse in that way because synapse can be a very very lightweight way of processing loading and casting structure over data right because when you create a synapse workspace you are essentially just creating a a a, a um, a blank canvas where you can create your load loading pipelines. You can create a, a serverless SQL pools database and a lake database. And it does a very specific thing. When we look at Fabric, it does loads of things. <laughs> so I'd still so I still advocate Synapse Analytics for data loading, for pipelines, for um, you know, a lake house architecture. And Microsoft are making it easy to integrate those services into the world of Fabric. And if you do want to take your pipelines and recreate them in Fabric, I mean, at the moment you can't import your pipelines or your, your templates, then, well, it's the same interface, right? Data Factory, Synapse Pipelines and Fabric Pipelines. Um, Yes, and that was the great blog by uh, Paul Andrew. 
Um, and then we'll go into a bit of a demo in which, hey, let's look at these services actually working together. And I'll go through uh, I'll go through why. So Synapse Analytics, it was announced at the end of 2019. I think it was, uh, was it uh, uh, one of the Ignite conferences? That's right. And it was an umbrella concept. So bringing together data warehousing. So Azure SQL Data Warehouse was being renamed dedicated SQL pools. Big data analytics because they were bringing Spark. So Spark front and center in one of Microsoft's um, product offerings that wasn't Azure Databricks, because obviously Databricks is a is a separate company. Bringing Data Factory into Synapse as pipelines, there was machine learning, and they then added services like real-time streaming for Custo, so you know KQL and Data Explorer. Now they released it as a platform as a service, right? So you know, the the three as a services that we know of or the common as a services are you know, infrastructure as a service, platform and um, software as a service. Infrastructure as a service, you have more control over, but you have to manage more of it all the way over to the right hand side with software as a service where you don't really get to manage it. You just use it. Yeah. Every time you log into your Outlook, well, that's just software as a service. Then actually you have to stand up your own email server. It just works. So it's a platform as a service. Now we had dedicated SQL pools, large scale data warehousing, yeah, multi, multi terabyte. So this wasn't for your 50 gig, 100 gig, 500 gig data warehouse. This was where it really started to work when it was multi terabyte. So I think the greatest um, analogy from well from the, the 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 dedicated SQL pool product team themselves was well you wouldn't drive a Ferrari to the shops. So it was a specific service for very large scale data warehousing. They introduced serverless SQL pools, which is going to be relevant when we talk about Fabric. So this was a service brand new to Microsoft in which, well, we didn't store any data, but we were using T-SQL. We were bringing our existing T-SQL skills to the world of the data lake. So I'm not saying prior to serverless SQL pools because Databricks had obviously been doing great things um, it, you know, in this space. And of course, all of those other companies, uh, you know, Cloudera, um, Hortonworks, I remember, you know, using Hortonworks well, you know, a good few years ago now, Microsoft now released a service in which you can bring your T-SQL skills and cast structure over data in a data lake and model, model your data. Spark, yes, we had Spark pools. So if you were a Scala expert or a PySpark expert, well, now you can run your data engineering workloads within Synapse Analytics. One of the biggest criticisms with the Spark workloads in Synapse Analytics was the, quite frankly, awful cluster startup times, which were lengthy. But bring your Bring your bring your PySpark workloads, bring your Scala workloads into Synapse Analytics. They added Data Explorer or Data Explorer pools for real time streaming. So you could build out your 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 real time streaming uh, analysis solutions using KQL. That was added after. So it wasn't there from from day one in terms of Synapse Analytics. And how do we tie this all together with data loading? Well, pipelines, a.k.a. Data Factory. So this is about connecting to all of those services on premises, third party, cloud. Transforming your data and landing it somewhere for you to use. Now we're what February 2024, and unfortunately we haven't had exact feature parity between Data Factory 
and Synapse pipelines. There are still some things in Synapse pipelines that are just not there that have caused some consternation. You know, why can't we have you know global parameters? Why can't we share integration runtimes across Synapse workspaces? And Power BI. Now, this is I don't want to dwell on this too much, but hey, Microsoft thought, well, let's bring Power BI into Synapse Analytics so you can create data sets and you can create reports within Synapse Studio. Um, now, if anyone knows any companies or any people that really use this functionality, please let me know. I didn't really see it too much out in the wild because, well, essentially, when you were creating Power BI data sets within Synapse Analytics, all it was really doing was just creating a connection for you and you would open Power BI Desktop and do your model in there. Yes, you could create reports within Synapse Studio, within the interface, and save it to a Power BI workspace. But Synapse Analytics was more for the data engineering professional. So most of the audience was the data, data engineering. You weren't really going to bring your analysts into the world of Synapse Analytics to do your Power BI work. And Synapse Studio tied it all together. The web UI, I have to say, I, and I still do, I still love the Synapse Studio interface. I still love the UI. I can create my SQL scripts, my Spark notebooks, my pipelines. I can tie it all together. Yeah, still an advocate of it. I really am. But we had control because it was platform as a service. So we could choose the compute tier of dedicated SQL pool. Within the dedicated SQL pool itself, we could set up how our tables were distributed, how they were partitioned. We had control over caching, so result set caching. We could use workload management. I used to talk about workload management all the time. I used to bore people to tears about workload management because in effect, you could make your one dedicated SQL pool multi-cluster by splitting out your workload into or, or isolating workloads across your dedicated SQL pool. So you could have a dedicated SQL pool with, let's say, a terabyte of RAM and you could a certain amount of compute and you could partition off and say, right, these people over here can have 200 gig. Well, this team over here could have 100 gig. The ETL processes can have 500 gig, right? It got quite granular, yeah? And it was it was very deep, very configurable. Yes, you could you know uh, choose the size of your Data Explorer pools. You had control over your Spark pools configuration and Data Factory. So in pipelines, you could choose, well, how much compute are you going to use across your uh, pipelines themselves, copying data, but also mapping data flows, which again, were designed to abstract Spark into a UI, but they were pretty clunky. I love the idea of mapping data flows. I wish they were a little bit more flexible, let's say. Now, one of the problems with Synapse Analytics is that, well, there was loads of different cost structures per service. You had to understand how dedicated SQL pools were priced. You had to understand Spark pools. You had to understand how serverless was being a new service with a completely different way of costing uh, storage pipelines. So you had to understand lots and lots of different aspects. And even one of those services, you could fill an entire session with the cost and the pricing and how you work out the pricing of those services. So not the easiest in terms of understanding, however, more control, right? So if you understood the services, then you, you and, and you understood the pricing, then kudos to you because it's more control. Now we go to Microsoft Fabric. So hang on, so we go data flows in Azure Synapse Analytics at Gen 1. Yeah, yeah, sorry if I misunderstood. Yeah, I mean, no, 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 Halil, I've, I've got it, I've got it right here. So I'll, you know, I'll always just kind of, um, uh, you know, look in there. So, well, no, data flow. Well, uh, there were two types of data flows within uh, Synapse Analytics. So you had your mapping data flows, 
which have not been carried forward. Um, and you had your, well, the Power Query data flows that, that were available, but again, didn't have feature parity with those data flow Gen 1s that you had in Power BI. Of course, in Fabric, we've got data flow Gen 2s, which are you know built on on uh, on Spark. So, yeah, the data flows in in Synapse Analytics. I mean, no, not not Gen One as in Power BI Gen One. If that's if that's I think what you mean. Um, but if we come to Fabric, so we get Fabric announcement. So uh, May twenty twenty three, it goes into public preview. So everyone gets their hands on it and. You know, it's it's safe to say that it had it that it's been in um, public preview for uh, a few months, but when it was announced uh, into uh, into into public, it'd been in pre private preview for a few months into public preview. There was a lot to take in. There really there really was, and one of the things was, oh, so this is another service which ties everything together, but isn't that what Synapse was? So if you look. I literally have not changed the tagline. As your cloud analytics service, which brings together data warehousing, big data analytics, data integration, machine learning, and real time streaming. Okay, technically it's not an Azure cloud service, but the same things are there. Warehousing, big data analytics, data integration, machine learning, real time streaming. What's going on? I thought we'd already had this in terms of Synapse Analytics. Now, of course, what they've now done is instead of taking Power BI workloads into the, wor into the world of data engineering and warehousing, they've done it the other way around. So now we have the software as a service platform, Power BI. Now with the data warehousing and data engineering workloads in that service. So how do I explain fabric uh, to someone who asks me? Well, I say, well, it adds significant functionality to a Power BI tenant. It might be oversimplifying it, but that's the way I look at it, because essentially you are logging into Power BI. Yes, it has a fabric URL as well, but it's a Power BI tenancy. But it's now, of course, fabric tenancy as well. So now in any of my documentation, I write, I literally put fabric forward slash power bi tenancy pricing and processing compute was hugely simplified but also kind of made a little bit complex as well because now what we're doing is we're purchasing capacity units we're purchasing cus so anyone who has a power bi premium p1 capacity well their fabric capacity is an f64 now, why 64? Well, it's because we can actually create fabric capacities in Azure down to an F2. So 32 times, in theory, less compute or compute parallelism as an F64. And of course, we get an F128, 256, and so on and so forth. So, hey, we know we now long, we now no longer have to worry about understanding pricing or understanding how compute works. Well, <laughs> uh, yes, we do. Andy, may I have a question? Yes. Uh, it starts with F2 down to F64. Is there any important differences technical wise between F2 and F64, except the number of users who can uh, who can use the capacity. I'm wondering the uh, feature set parity between F2 and F64. Yeah, great question, Halil. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, so feature parity in terms of fabric features itself is there's complete... He dropped. Yeah. 
Anyone here who is afraid of using public? I'm not recommending it to my customers yet. Not even as it's in GA already. Sorry, say again, Fernando. Not even because it's already GA. Yeah, it is already GA, but uh, I believe it's a bit early to announce it as GA because many many features are a bit lacking behind compared to Azure Data Factory or Synapse. But Microsoft is so fast that <laughs> it's very difficult to to catch them. They change many things very frequently. Okay, let's wait for Andy to rejoin us. <clears throat> Yeah, Teams issue. Hope you solve it soon. Using Synapse, but replacing dedicated pool with Azure SQL database. Uh, it's a bit hard to answer that question, Gonzalo. From my point of view, I recommend my customers to use to to use uh, Azure SQL database as a data warehouse, totally separated from the or unrelated from the public things. But I'm closely following what Microsoft is doing with Fabric. I find it a bit risky using Fabric in production directly. But this is my opinion. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is raining a lot. Okay, you are back. Hello, sorry, my um, team's dropped. Yeah, no, no, no problem. Let me make you presenter again. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So where did we get up to? So we were talking about, so can you hear me okay? Yeah, Chris. Yeah, so we were talking about, um, well, control. Well, sorry, we were, we, were, we were answering a question about feature parity. So I, mm -hmm. I, did, did we answer that okay? Which was essentially, yes, same features with an F2 to an F64, except with an F64 and above, We've got the concept of you know free users within Power BI. Okay, so then, but the biggest departure um, in terms of storage is that Microsoft have now gone in on the Delta Lake format. So, with the data warehousing service, and when we're using data engineering to create tables. From a data engineering perspective, yes, we still we still have options. We can you know, create tables and cast structure over CSVs and Parquet, but the recommended storage format is Delta from a Lakehouse table perspective and is also essential for it being viewable in the SQL endpoint and uh, the semantic model, which will which will cover. But yes, the biggest and I'd love to be a fly on the wall when Microsoft had um, uh, had talked about uh, creating uh, the storage and configuring it as the the Delta Lake format. And yes, all services run under a single cost model. So you purchase a capacity, you're going to pay, you know, a certain price for that capacity, and all your workloads are going to be using that capacity. Now, there are calculations that can be done to work out, well, based on your capacity usage, uh, capacity units usage per service, 
you can work out, well, how much is that workload costing you? Now, in terms of service mapping, so I'll cover this pretty quickly. So with Synapse and Fabric, yes, in Synapse, we had dedicated SQL pool where we're importing data into a warehouse service. The storage was backed by SSDs. In Fabric, what do we have? Well, OK, so we're going to be creating a warehouse. So this is where you're bringing your SQL expertise, because that's essentially what you were doing from a dedicated SQL pool perspective, T-SQL, the warehouse T-SQL. So if you're a T-SQL shop, then the warehouse is going to be the service that you can use because you'll be able to use your T-SQL expertise. There's not exactly feature parity there in terms of T-SQL. There is something called the T-SQL surface area, which tells you what isn't supported. So there are, and it could be some showstoppers for people at the moment. You've got, you don't have the ability to, to alter a table. So you create a table in a warehouse, you can't alter it and add a column. I sincerely hope that that functionality gets added very, very soon. Okay, You don't have support for the merge statement. Now, I know, and obviously this isn't for, for, for this meeting, but, uh, you know, lots of uh, lots of discussions previously in the, in the SQL Server world about using merge. Uh, some people absolutely hate it. Um, other people like it. But we don't have an option here. It's not supported in the warehouse. However, the storage in the warehouse is this delta format, which, yes, you don't have to worry about because that's just how it's storing the data. Spark pools. So we could create spark pools in Synapse, bring your Python, your Scala, uh, your, 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 you know, your, your SQL expertise. And in the world of Fabric, yes, we, we do have control. We can create a workspace. We can create Spark clusters. We can size those Spark clusters. We can set auto scale settings. We can set Spark um, version settings. We had a concept in Synapse called a lake database. Now, lake databases were really the spark side of things within the world of Synapse. And again, lake databases, you were creating lake databases, you were populating lake databases with Spark. So again, you could use PySpark, Scala, so on and so forth. So in Fabric, I kind of view those as the lake house, right? Because the lake house, the files and tables, you know, in a lake house is the spark side of things within Fabric. So when you're uh, loading data into a lake house table, yes, you can use pipelines and, and, and data flow Gen 2s, but notebooks, so you'll be using PySpark, Scala to, to load uh, lake house tables, serverless SQL pools, which was, to be honest, it was the read only service in Synapse in terms of being able to cast structure over data in a data lake. So it had support for Parquet, it had support for Delta. Delta was added. Not all of the features of Delta were available, so we couldn't time travel, which I felt was a huge disadvantage. I hope that's added to Synapse serverless SQL pools at some stage. Um, and but that service, I mean, it could write data out, but it was very, very simplistic. Well, I kind of view that as the Lakehouse SQL endpoint, which is read only. Now, one of the interesting things here is in Synapse. If you created a lake database. So let's say you had um, you know, PySpark notebooks and you were writing Python to transform data, uh, create tables and load tables in a lake database. A lake database would actually have a metadata sync process 
where you could use serverless SQL pools. You could use the serverless SQL pools engine, which is a completely different engine. It's not a Spark engine. It's, an, it, it's the engine that now runs the SQL side of things within Fabric, so the SQL endpoint and the warehouse service. But there was a metadata sync where you could uh, use the serverless SQL pools service to select data from a lake database. We go into the world of Fabric. Yes, you're using, you know, uh, Spark to create uh, lake house tables. But the lake house SQL endpoint actually has metadata synced to it from a lake house table. So some people see a slight delay in a table appearing within a lake house and it being queryable within a lake house SQL endpoint. So in Synapse, you create a lake database, create a table, populate, you can query it with serverless SQL pools, but there was a metadata sync process going on under the hood. It's the same in Fabric with lake houses and the SQL endpoint. So I just want to make sure that my Teams is still working OK. I think I can um, hear Halil saying yes, that's uh, that's OK. So in terms of patterns between these two services, so a warehouse pattern, yes. So in the world of Synapse, uh, yes, we had, you know, spark pools, we could, you know, transform data, uh, load that data and put it somewhere in uh, in a warehouse. We had pipelines and data flows. We could store that data in, you know, uh, an Azure Data Lake storage account. And then we could load it into dedicated SQL pools. And again, dedicated SQL pools really for multi terabyte scenarios where you want data in a relational structure. Maybe that's your fact and dimension. Maybe that's your aggregate data. But you're going to load it into semantic models and reports. OK, so we're processing data. Yeah, we're using pipelines and data flows. We're storing it in you know, a, a storage account. The best way of getting your data into a dedicated SQL pool was using the copy into. This is where you really got the power of dedicated and you could really, really use all of those DWUs because it parallelized the loading process across all those compute nodes and storage nodes. I tested many, many, many times uh, loading data into dedicated and copy into was always by far the quickest. But you were delivering reports using Power BI. Yes, Fabric, you know, we've got pipelines, we've got data flows. We've got the power of T-SQL in the warehouse. But again, we're connecting a semantic model to that warehouse. It's no good on its own. We still need to model the data and present it to the business users. We've got reports. And we're processing using pipelines, data flows, T-SQL. And yeah, delivering, you know, delivering via semantic models and reports. Lakehouse. Now, yes, people did implement the Lakehouse pattern within Synapse Analytics. Again, I really wish that serverless SQL pools had more functionality in reading Delta. I didn't really care about serverless being able to write data to Delta. I didn't really care about that because you had Spark to do that. I just wish it had more functionality in terms of time travel. Um, but Lakehouse architectures, yep, Synapse could do that. So Spark pools, data flows to load and transform your data, land that into Azure Data Lake Gen 2 storage. Past structure over it using serverless SQL pools, so you're not actually loading data into another service. But we're building models. All right now, yes, you could connect your Power BI uh, models in direct query to serverless SQL pools if you wanted real time data, i.e. as soon as it hit a data lake. And your semantic model was loading from an external table or a view in your serverless SQL pools, we had that data instantly. Very useful in hybrid tables scenario, yeah, where you had a real time partition, which was just the current day, but everything else was import. 
Um, but yes, we are um, very much using pipelines and data flows, notebooks to load that data in. We're storing it in Gen 2, and but we're creating a logical data warehouse. So this is just casting structure over data in a data lake. Now this I still think this is a perfectly valid and popular pattern because from a, 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 an infrastructure perspective, you can create a Synapse workspace, very lightweight. If you've got data in a, a, an ADLS Gen 2 account, well, yes, you could use the serverless SQL pool service to create a database, create external tables, create views over that data and load that into Power BI. In the world of Fabric, now we've got notebooks, PySpark, we've got pipelines, we've got Dataflow Gen 2s. And now we've got a concept of a lake house, whereby this is a very Spark driven um, process. We can load data into this lake house, but we've still got semantic models, right? We've still got the ability to model data and deliver it reports into the business. But we've got pipelines, data flow, Gen 2s and notebooks to transform and load that data. Andy, may I ask a question regarding the previous two slides? Yes. Just for, for the right hand side. Uh, we have pipelines, data flow, Gen 2 and Lakehouse. And in the previous one, we had SQL Data Warehouse. Which one should we choose in terms of performance? And <laughs> so. Very good question. Well, from a performance perspective, it shouldn't matter. So if you're loading your data into a lake house and you're loading your data into um, tables and you are following Microsoft's recommended practice, which is create your tables in the Delta format. Well, in the warehouse, you don't actually have a choice. When you create your tables in the warehouse, they are automatically created as Delta. However, you have a bit of less control in the warehouse than the lake house in terms of things like partitioning. So in the warehouse, you can't actually create a table and define a partition scheme. Right. And this has been, I think, one of uh, one of the issues that uh, people that people maybe have faced, which is, well, I have no control over how my data is being loaded into the warehouse. OK, so there is some considerations um, for performance there. Uh, in terms of downstream performance, so the new connectivity method, direct lake, which is the ability for a semantic model to not have to import the data into its own, you know, into, into its semantic model, into the Vertipak engine. It can just go directly to the Delta storage, take the compressed data and just transcode that compressed data directly into the Vertipak engine on demand, cache it. The lake house and the warehouse, yes, there's some there's some parity there in doing that. However, with the warehouse being a predominantly SQL based service, you may be uh, using views to virtualize um, you know, some objects. And unfortunately, that's going to break your direct lake um, functionality, as is features like row level security and object level security, which is a bit of a bummer. Um, lake house. You know, yeah. So from a for, for, yeah from a performance aspect, you've probably got a bit more control in the lake house over you know partitioning, whereas the warehouse, not so much. So I think people are people are worried um, about well the concept of you know data movement, right? Because you know with the lake house, SQL endpoint, and with the warehouse, it's a SQL engine, it's uh, an auto scale out engine under the hood you have no control over that at all so when we're reading data if we don't have any form of partitioning how are we doing any form of partition elimination so i was sort of hoping a little bit more control on the warehouse is going to come soon in terms of that um is that okay halil yeah yeah thank you thank you andy cool cool but from microsoft's perspective 
their sort of headline is that it doesn't it should not matter whether you've got data in a lake house or a warehouse the performance will be the same however we all know that we need to dive into that a little bit more and uh, and, and do our own testing um yeah from fernando so do i already own the fabric capacity well how are you using the trial capacity but i'm also using the azure f SKU capacities as well for certain testing so things like fabrics multi geo um architecture in which you can create a fabric capacity in a different region and your data is going to be stored in that region i do my testing with uh, with azure f SKUs, but no i have um you know i have you know a uh, just a just a regular trial capacity so in terms of demos yep i've got uh, seven you know a few minutes left but i want to talk about interoperability actually i think that's the one thing that i want to uh, to get across in the next few minutes is that look you can work within fabric you can create shortcuts over data in a data lake if you've got existing and this will work for data factory as well as Synapse Analytics. If you've got existing data loading processes within Synapse Analytics, for not much effort, you can expose that and actually load that into Fabric itself. So for example, I have created a Power BI workspace. I've already created a lake house, right? Now that was literally as simple as switching to the data engineering persona, clicking new, clicking lake house, and giving the lake house a name. So I've got this lake house available here. Now, if I click into that lake house, I don't have anything there. I've got no files, I've got no tables. It's completely empty. I have already set up the security to be able to do this, which if you want to connect a Synapse Analytics workspace and load and read data, or load data into a fabric lake house, you're going to need to set up a service principle. I've already done that. And if I go into my workspace and just have a look at the permissions, then you can see that I've got my service principle that I created. So I've got a secret ID and so on and so forth. So that will be destroyed after this demo. Um, yes, I've added the Synapse workspace itself, the managed identity of the workspace into the fabric, into the fabric uh, workspace so I can read data as well. But if I go into fabric or if I go into Synapse, well, let me just uh, whack the, uh, the size up. So what I can do is I can actually create a linked service. So I've already created a linked service to a fabric lake house. So I'm going to open that. Right now, I've got a, a workspace ID and a lake house object ID. You can get these from the fabric REST APIs. Alternatively, if you're a little bit lazy like me, you can literally go to the Fabric workspace and in your URL, well, there's my workspace. And if I click in here, there's my lake house ID. So I can take the two GUIDs into Fabric and say, well, there's my Fabric workspace ID. There's my, there's my lake house object ID. Or actually, I can do it from a selection as well. So I can select select my uh, select my workspace in there. Now I have created a service principle and added that. So I've got my principal ID and I've uh, added it you know, to uh, to my link service. So I already have my connection set up to my fabric workspace. From a pipeline perspective, so if I just open up a pipeline, what I've done here is, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the pipeline running. What I've done, I've got a copy data task, right? So common across data factory, common across synapse pipelines, and I've got 
the source of data. Now, just for this example, the source of the data is in a data lake. It's in CSV format. And I'm actually going to sync it into the Fabric Lake House. So look, I've got my link service, right? I've got a file path to say, well, I want to put this data in a folder called Synapse Raw, which is going to be physically moved into my Fabric Lake House. So if I go back to my pipeline and we'll just uh, we'll just refresh that and we'll see that's in progress. And that's probably about five million rows and it takes about two or three minutes to run that through. But what I can also do is and I won't actually run the pipeline, but if I go into pipelines. And move and transform. I just want to show the destination. So what I can do is. If I just choose a lake house, I've got the opportunity to save it to a table. So what will happen is within Data Factory or within Synapse Pipelines, I can get the data from whatever source that I'm getting the data from. And I can directly load it into a fabric lake house as a delta table. It will be physically moving that data in. OK, so. Why would you want to do this? Well, augmenting existing Synapse pipelines where you want some of the data to be available within Fabric or created as a Fabric table. Alternatively, you can shortcut from Fabric into the Data Lake account and access the data from that way. But I really, really like the ability from Data Factory and Synapse pipelines to be able to interact with the fabric ecosystem via the lake house, both from a files perspective and uh, as a tables perspective. So I want to go back to this pipeline and see we've succeeded. We've got a few million rows here. Uh, if I go back into my synapse, into my uh, fabric workspace and just refresh, well, now I've got my data available here. I could maybe just uh, load that to a new table. Now, yes, so for so Fernando, your point there is that you would be paying. So if you've already got a existing data factory workflows or existing Synapse pipeline workflows, so existing Synapse pipelines, this is where I've implemented this, right? So you are saving your data into fabric so yes you'll have to look at the additional cost in terms of what the pipeline is doing when saving the data into the fabric lake house right but then your data is available within that fabric fabric lake house right if you save it to an azure data lake gen 2 account then from a fabric perspective if you're then loading the data from that azure data lake or you're reading the data from the azure data lake you're going to be using your fabric capacity for that you're going to be using your CUs for that so yes like always do your due diligence do your testing but I have implemented the ability to write data into the fabric lake house from synapse pipelines um, so yeah so if you, if you have a look at that data now then I'll load the preview and that should uh, that should appear Right, so Synapse, yeah, private endpoints. So at the moment, if you're as your Data Lake Gen 2 account is hidden, i.e. it doesn't have public access, so the only way of getting to it is through a private endpoint. So for example, if your Synapse Analytics workspace is in a managed VNet, which by the way, your Synapse workspace has to be in a managed VNet to be able to write data into a fabric lake house. But if you're connecting to your storage account, which has no public access, you're not going to be able to use things like um, pipelines in um, in fabric. And I think the only functionality that is supported for a storage account that's hidden 
I keep saying hidden, that is secured from public access is to use a Dataflow Gen 2 because Dataflow Gen 2 supports um, VNet gateways that allow you to connect in. But no, I'm going to say no. I could be proved wrong, but I, you, you're not going to be able to create a shortcut to a data lake account that has no public access and that can only be accessed by private endpoints. Um, so I think I want to conclude there. Yeah, so we've gone through the differences between the two services, but then, hey, I wanted to show those two services working together if you were looking at making data available within Fabric, if you were looking to augment existing pipelines in Data Factory or Synapse, and possibly from a migration perspective as well. So I'm just going to ask if there's any more questions. Yeah, we can continue to talk about this all day long. I have a question for you, Andy. Uh, how about let's forget about those very technical things and use only data flow Gen 2 in fabric with output destination, let's say SQL data warehouse. How about this one? What's your opinion? I really wish that the data flow Gen 2s had more flexibility. I what what so what I mean by that is you know, I would like data flow Gen 2s. I would like to be able to parameterize, you know, you know, data flow Gen 2s a lot more in terms of source and destination. Um, I see them as, as as kind of a very fixed service where, you know, you are defining up front your schema, you are defining up front your loading processes. Um, so with data flow Gen 2s, yes, you know, you are essentially um using well the 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 tried and tested power bi power query gui to create your loading processes into the warehouse and anyone with m expertise well, happy days because well you know data flow gen 2s it's essentially building on the you know it, it's build building on power bi data flows so if you've got expertise in m the you know the power query language then data flow gen 2s are going to be very attractive in terms of loading data i think for the warehouse service i would probably st stick with sql because that's that's ultimately what it's for and again it's about persona it's about your experience you know if you're coming at uh, if you're coming at fabric and you want to, uh, you know, you come from a Spark background, well, then, you know, the lake house is there for you. And you can deliver your end to end analytics, you know, all, you know, your different layers, all using the lake house. Or, you know, your SQL expertise, then the warehouse is there for you. Does that answer your question, Hill? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that, Andy. Uh, from my side, this is my favorite uh, way of doing things in Fabric. Because I find the Power Query much more friendly. Exactly. So, mm -hmm. you know, your way of loading data into a service downstream is perfect. And Microsoft have said, you know, and Microsoft are investing in you know, data flow Gen 2s. I think there's been a new feature announced, which is fast loading. So Microsoft are not pigeonholing data flow Gen 2s as just, you know, some, you know, just a way to get data into a model or to populate, you know, uh, you know, some storage, which was, you know, the existing data flows. They're actually saying, hey, you can use this to load your lake house and your warehouse down, downstream if this is the way that you load data. If this is your expertise, it's just from my perspective, I, I would like um, just some more parameterization options available with uh, with Dataflow Gen 2s. Yeah, it's a missing thing currently. I agree. 
Anyone has question for us for Andy? I don't know, well, actually, just unmute yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we've had we've had loads of great questions. Thanks. Like, yeah, like I said, I you know, I wanted to keep it interactive because uh, you know, I think, you know, first off, you know, the creation of Microsoft Fabric, there's a big why there when we've got Synapse Analytics. So, you know, why have Microsoft created Fabric? You know, why would we want these services? Well, why would we want to use each of these services? But I do like the interoperability as well um, between the two services. If you're looking to perhaps transition, if you're looking to augment a pipeline and make some data available within uh, Fabric, which is what I'm currently doing with a, 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 a Synapse process. Um, but yeah, like I said, I'm on Twitter, so I think, you know, my Twitter's uh, Mr. Andy Cutler. And yeah, I love talking about this stuff. So, you know, feel free to reach out. OK, thanks a lot for joining me, Andy. That was a great session. It's always a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Halil. Thanks for inviting me again. OK, thanks a lot. Take care, everyone. Bye bye. Take care.